Um, just for the benefit of um, the people who have only ever seen me do my more sort of theatrical stuff, um, the contents of this book are a tad serious to say the least. Um, but I'm going to throw in two or three poems, uh, humorous poems that aren't in the book, just so we're not all slashing our wrists by the interval. <laughs> do you two want to come out from there? Are you all right? No, we're all right. I know what you look like. Pretend it's on the radio. <laughs> Right, so um, with that in mind, I'm going to start with a poem that's inspired by my brother's coroner's report. Uh, not a favourite poem with everybody. Um, and when I went on to write another poem about his funeral and visiting his grave, it struck me, struck me that this was because his lifestyle had been very much um, hushed up. And um, poetry is not normally a vehicle for hushing up, but for being open and honest. Hence the title of that poem and the title of the book. Coroner's Report. They call you gentlemen, then list the quantities of heroin, crack and alcohol, head injuries, cellulitis. Hey, no wonder you were depressed, the groin abscess injected just the day before. Nicotine on your fingers, dirt under your nails, no lipstick on your collar. Asthmatic. Keep that cat off his bed, Mum said. Hepatitis C. Unwashed feet. Time of death. Lungs congested. Kidneys disintegrated. But sorry, mate. Your intestines were unremarkable. Hush. Pink. Awakening, persistent in its climbing, white echo, needy for sun, red and resistant blaze, and in my teeth a dog rose, wild and needle sharp, torn from the oasis of a collective conscience. I refuse to underwrite the estimable silence through which your soundtrack seeps. My tongue is held by a scold bridle as ancient songs extinguish the man you became. I bundle your secrets from off the page, take my dry semantics to the rough stone and barren sod that mark you, a mute fire starter bearing flammable ink and flowers. a little bit lighter. Um, this poem was inspired by um, a series of uh, incidents that, take, that took place at the uh, department store where I work and some people here tonight might recognise some of those if I can find where the poem is. There we are. And it's called um, The Shop Assistant's Guide to Faith. Denied his face his forehead touching the floor, his compact kneeling body separating me from lunch in the locker that evidently faces Mecca. A contract cleaner, unaware of the prayer facilities. His prayer mat not the intricate design of village weavers, but self-assembly flooring intended for the latest promotion. Unsure of the weight, Unhappy to straddle this stoic, I lean on tiptoe, turn the key. My return finds flooring neatly stacked, showing no sign of religious significance. In the Christmas department, the Magi are in abeyance. A tearful housewife finds an absence of nativity sets. I recall the assortment from previous years. How out of hours, the shepherds and stable animals were rearranged into interesting positions. <laughs> there was a 20% reduction for a missing king. But when the baby Jesus went missing, there was no suitable markdown. Still, he hadn't helped with the lottery. When the wooden advent calendar fell to the floor and six windows stayed shut, we gambled and lost. Some have removed themselves from this paucity of faith. 
are reunited with their God in dusty corners. Others wander among the festive themes from Nordic to glamorous, still clinging to their own pocket Christ. I'm going to um, slip in one of the poems I said I was going to do that isn't in the book, and this is also sort of inspired by um, work as well. Um, I work in the furniture department at, at Peter Jones, and um, we do end up sending a lot of furniture to customers down in Cornwall. So whenever anybody says, um, oh, the goods are going down to Cornwall, I immediately say, oh, I'm Cornish, and I come from blah, blah, blah. And, and um, sometimes, just very, very occasionally, the customer does turn out to be Cornish, uh, or at least living properly in Cornwall, in which case, it's you, oh, yes, I know where you live, and do you know so-and-so? No. But most of the time, they are second home owners. And you say, oh, I come from Cornwall, and they look at you and say, so, <laughs> so uh, this is Chelsea by Sea, just for a bit of fun. I have brought the greenest wellies and the most expensive barber, and for £300,000 we will place down by the harbour, and damn the smelly fishermen that sit upon our wall. If it wasn't for the Henshaw Smiths, we'd not come here at all. <laughs> there are dead fish on the quayside, the aroma is quite disgusting, and we cannot light the fire until we stop the seagulls nesting, and damn the local children, damn all the rural poor. They can't speak proper English, and they've scratched our four by four. Thank heavens someone civilised has moved the peasants from next door. A nice couple from Belgravia, Gerald Smith and Clara Henshaw, and damn the smelly fishermen who sit upon our wall. If it wasn't for the Henshaw Smiths, we'd not come here at all. Our girl that does wear shoes indoors, and her husband calls me lover. The pasty that she made me eat has made me gain four pounds or more, and damn the local children, damn all the rules. Poor. They can't speak proper English, and they've scratched our four by four. I must get up to Harley Street, I must get some liposuction, but I'm stuck behind a tractor on the way into the station, and damn the smelly fishermen that sit up on our wall. If it wasn't for the Henshaw Smiths, we'd not come here at all. <laughs> of poems in the book about my family and um, because they are a sequence um, there are things that sort of you know follow on from one to the other so I'm going to do um, three together they're not that long um, the first one is about my growing up and um, my father was very involved with motor racing he did autocross racing and he also used to sponsor um, motorcycle um, racers as well. So most of our Sundays um, were spent going to motor racing events. So it occurred to me, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but looking back that our Sundays were probably much more exciting um, than those of most of my school friends. Um, so I've actually written it in the voice of an, of an imaginary child living next door to us. And then the next two are um, sonnets and the first one is about my mother's home, my home as I remember it growing up. So the home of a woman who was very much tied to her family, didn't go out a great deal, her whole life revolved around looking after her husband and children. And the second one is about a day in my sister's house, an, an adult life, a, a modern woman without children who had the, had the luxury of a more sophisticated home. So they kind of sort of go together. Next door, um, and this is sort of circa uh, Cornwall, circa about 1969. Come on, baby, light my fire, turned low. Next door, as they were referred to, four kids, or was it three by then, prepare to roar away. Father in his wing back, asleep, head bent into the velour. All you need is love turned off. Next door are pushing their luck, are not wearing that, piling on board. Their dad's painted racing car on the trailer behind. Don't tease your sister. Where's his inhaler? Mother says, it's like Vietnam in there. Natives escaping into gorse jungle, disguised by mud, 
led captive onto tartan rugs, eating hot dogs, reading the news of the world. I am tortured by anemic vegetables in Bisto, interrogated over next door's attendance at Sunday school as I gag on greens and think of Biafra. Faces disfigured by sauce, smoke and oil, next door roar back up the drive in their dad's Land Rover. Father stirs, breaks wind, says you can't beat a Parker knob. <laughs> Her home, one. Monday, wash day, liver and bacon, chops on a Tuesday, casserole on Wednesday, hoover and dust. Thursday, fish and chips, Friday, change the beds, something with mince. Saturday, toad in the hole, mash the floors and windows. Sunday, a roast or pasties, to be taken to the beach or watch motor racing, eaten with sauce. Sometimes put cheese in it or parsley, don't bother with sage, thyme and rosemary. Hot meals, simple meat and two vegetables served on the dot. Portions, large and hearty, butchers and bakers in vans come round on set days and bring everything to the house. Her home too. The warring world removes its combat boots checking itself for dust by dying light. An insubordinate sun defies the nets, casting its shadow on the homely range. All fresh ingredients, costed, weighed, their spit and bubble carefully contained. The marmalade, the curds, dated and named, chastise the pile on spirit level towels. Mother within her guilt upon the shelf, smiles down approval through her cataracts. The silk held prisoned in the campaign chest is married off amongst the polished ranks. Creams and potions close the door behind, condensing water with its final breath. <laughs> Take the, of the interval with one more that isn't um, in the book. Um, and it's a shame that my very best friend in all the world, Maxine, isn't here tonight because she came round to my house with a few friends on New Year's Eve and she spent a good part of the evening on my landing um, having photographs taken of her with various bits of tape over her mouth um, in order to produce... Can you hold it up, Emil? <laughs> this wonderful book cover, but she's sick and can't be here. Um, and the rest of the evening, uh, we all got very, very drunk. And uh, the next day, Maxine said to me on the phone, do you remember telling me this story, not a true story, I say, about how you'd... Um, you got so fed up not being famous that you decided to go into the local supermarket and refused to leave until somebody recognised you. <laughs> and that the manager had thrown you out because you were stopping people getting to the frozen peas. And I said, I don't remember a word of that, Maxine. And I thought, but it's a bloody good idea for a pony. <laughs> so this is my watercress years. When will the public acknowledge that I'm famous? Their denial of my literary prowess has me loitering in supermarkets waiting <coughs> to be recognised. Drawn to fresh vegetables, potato stanzas, the poetic symmetry of cauliflower. But my muse is unsettled by the area, the constant mopping, its proximity to the ringing tills. Unearthed, I opt for frozen. Here, young men toss Byronic fringes and ask why I am inspired by ice cream. Peas, I reply, occasionally sweet corn, and you'll never make a poet with that lack of observation. As the manager pleads, move, please, you're restricting the access to the petty poire. <laughs> Currently, uprooted in continental cheeses, I observe the salads. Rocket leaves in bags, half rhymes of their former selves. Beetroot minus its beat. Here, a renowned poet noted I was a local celebrity, easing me aside, heaving rock for camembert and cured a Neufchatel into a basket bereft of greens. It 
was a metaphor for weighty verse. Hardened arteries en route to a prize. Dismissing my suggestion of carrot batons, he made for the warmth of the bread counter. Mm. <laughs>